हरे कृष्णा सो वी मूविंग फॉरवर्ड इन द जर्नी इन द भगवद गीता टुडे वी कम टू द चैप्टर नाइन इट इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट डिवोशनल चैप्टर्स इन द गीता एंड दिस बिगिन्स विथ कृष्णा स्पॉन्टेनियसली स्पीकिंग ऑन दैट जस्ट लाइक एट द एंड ऑफ दिस सिक्स चैप्टर एंड कृष्णा से इज द टॉप मोस्ट योगी इज अ डिवोटी ना वेन सबडी मेक्स अ स्टेटमेंट लाइक दैट विच विच इज मेकिंग अ सिग्निफिकेंट क्लेम इन वन सेंस दैट स्टेटमेंट नीड्स टू बी बैकड अप by something substantial so generally when we speak hmm. oh dear so in the past especially both in india and the west there was a field of studies that was called rhetoric the rhetoric is basically the way to speak most effectively and what that means is that whenever we speak generally speak speech it needs to be at least in some sense linear a speech can be spontaneous but it has to be linear to be logical that means what one point of thought should follow another point of thought that's why often the word that uses train of thought like how is a train there may be multiple bogies multiple coaches might be there in america they don't use the word bogies because bogie is considered bogus <laughs> so <laughs> so so coaches are there but the coaches have to be linked together so train of thought means okay we might express one unit of thought it has to be followed by another unit of thought another unit of thought now of course the whole talk need not be one single tree it could a talk can be structured in different ways normally it would be one single tree but this is just one way of doing it another way could be you have a central point and we arrive at that point from different ways say for example if there's a talk on the existence of god so we have four arguments for the existence of god so then these are basically four different ways in which we are arriving at the same point but when i am speaking this point is no point in going over here and then trying to come back over is it when we are when we are having one point being made that point has to be a train of thought and generally speaking so the, the trains of thought can be different in the sense that there can be say four trains of thought within one session but they all are moving in particular directions another could be that say one train of thought goes in one direction another train of thought goes in another direction and then there's a third train of thought which which brings about a cohesion between the two cohesion between the two so this is technically called as thesis antithesis and then synthesis so this is often used for reconciling mm. so reconciling opposite so this is for like <laughs> multiple perspective persuasion and persuasion can be done as here it's more like linear persuasion straight linear uh, it is single uh 
single pointed linear persuasion. Now, it doesn't mean there's only one point over here, but there's one direction of thought over here. So talks can be persuasive, talks can be argumentative, but here it is more of mm, conciliate, conciliatory persuasion. Conciliatory means two people have some differences or two thoughts are different. We try to bring them together. So thoughts can, speech involves thoughts going in different ways. Now generally, while we can have a chain of thought like this, most of the times for speech to be truly interesting, it has to keep alternating between universals and specifics. Universal and specifics. So what do I mean? At the universal level, there are concepts, there are principles. At the specific levels, there are examples. Hmm? Examples could be analogies, they could be anecdotes. Now anecdotes could be real anecdotes, generally the word anecdotes is for real, but basically you could say there are stories. Uh, there could be also fictional narratives, there could be scriptural narratives. But the idea is that there are, there, are, there, are, there are these two things. So for example, if somebody is telling a point that, say we should be sensitive in our speech. Well, that's a principle. So a principle needs to be illustrated by some example. Sometimes some examples may be self-evident. Now, in different sessions, things may work differently. So, for example, a pastime-centered class may primarily have specifics with some universals coming in intermittently. So, this would be more like a Leela-centered class. So, for example, we may take the story of Mantra and Kai Kai and how Mantra was, Mantra misled Kai Kai. And there we could talk about the effect of bad association. So there, the specific story is going on for a longer time. And then the, the principle comes occasionally. On the other hand, there could be, there could be talks which are principle centered. And then there are stories that come out, specifics come out occasionally. So these you could say philosophy centered talks. Now, it's not just philosophy, it could be any intellectual intellectual content. So here, <coughs> the majority of content is concepts. And occasionally, there are examples. Now, these are in general more demanding intellectually. These, so these, you could say, are more for the masses. Because most people neither are, have the inclination for, nor the capacity for too much conceptual understanding. But these are generally for the classes. So the class is for the classes. So, <laughs> so what that means is that there are some people who want to understand the concepts. So the idea is that yeah, stories are nice, everybody likes stories. But sometimes it's like, okay, I heard the nice story, what did I really learn from it? Was it just entertainment? Now if you see, even something like movies, Movies often tell values. There are some values you conveyed to it. Sometimes it may be directly through the discussion among people, but it could be also through choices that the characters make. And maybe they deliberate on the choices or we may deliberate on their choices. So generally, when it is a story-centered thing, then it depends on the individual, how deep you go into it. Some people may just watch the story and enjoy it and end it. Some people may watch the story and they may deliberate. Hey, what is this? What is this? How is this related to my life? What does this choice mean? Or some, we just have some instinctive things. If you, are, if you are watching a movie or reading a novel, then, hey, I don't like this character. Now we may say, why don't we like this character? Maybe some of their personality qualities we don't like. But it's also that you know, maybe they can, they're making some bad choices. And that's why we don't like them. So basically, how deep one goes into a story that's up to the individual. And on the other hand, with respect to concepts, the, when the concepts are the primary focus, then the story is, it depends entirely on the speaker, 
how many stories to tell. So if you see among these two, if you consider two books, the Gita and the Bhagavatam, which falls in which category? Yes, the Bhagavatam falls more in the pastime centered and the Gita is philosophy centered. Now, in fact, the Gita has no stories, although Gita itself comes in the middle of a story. Hmm? Gita, come, Gita has no story specifically, although the Gita does have some metaphors. Hmm. So, quite a few metaphors are there actually in the Gita. But why are we talking about this? That when a talk is to be structured, hmm, at that time, there has to be a train of thought. And when there is a train of thought, so now, when for the train to move, there are rails below. And each rail has to be linked with the next tree. That is a link. So what happens is that when certain statements are made, if a speaker is thoughtful and say the audience is also thoughtful. So what happens is with each statement, if there's a statement and we could, so this is the speaker statements. So I'm going back a little into the psychology before I go into the Gita teaching psychology because why I'm doing this to appreciate what he, Krishna is doing in the Gita. Now, if you consider the audience reaction. Now reaction, we could talk in many terms, but let's focus more on one particular, particular point here. That is credibility. Um, how not the speaker's credibility, not the speak, how, how credible, credible means how believable, how logical, how acceptable they consider the statement to be. So let's make it acceptability. So each statement that comes up, if the statement makes sense, okay, the acceptability goes up. If the next statement also makes sense and the acceptability goes up further. And the next statement also makes sense and the acceptability goes up further. So now if we find that the speaker is making more and more acceptable statements, then after that, even if the speaker makes a statement which would are normally unacceptable, we become more open to consider it. Because what happens, some credibility has been built. But still, say, if this is a, if all these are, say, acceptable statements. But after an acceptable statement, say, now, after the statement, there comes another questionable. I can't really accept this. So then what happens is this acceptability at least has a question mark or sometimes it goes down. And then the speaker has to intuitively first know and also observe and recognize that certain statements require a certain amount of explanation, elaboration, illustration, justification. So various things we can talk about. Say for example, if we are talking about Indian spirituality. Now, everybody who's come here would expect that we will glorify Indian culture. And the concomment of that, we may bash Western culture. But say yesterday I made a point that oh, Indians uh, are good in some ways, but West is good about, say, financial ethics. That people, then I give an example of that. What was the example? You remember? If you give books, e-commerce, as a general example, for our own example, I give the example of books. We just give books and people give money and then we don't charge a price for it. It doesn't work like that. So now that statement would have seemed questionable unless I give some example for it. Now, if to an American audience I say, Indians are very cleanliness conscious. I say, I don't see that on the streets of India. Then we may say, okay. You know, oh, Indians are cleanliness conscious at the sense of their individual homes, not a public civic, civic consciousness. You say that if you go to Indian homes, they will be very clean and tidy. We say, okay, yeah, maybe that's true. So every statement we evaluate in terms of what we have heard or what we have experienced. 
and then the subsequent statement if it does just sometimes what if it doesn't relate with that statement at all then what happens is the speaker is going ahead but our head is caught in that statement how could you said that this doesn't make sense to me and then we miss out on ethics hmm? so that's why it's important for a speaker to not make statements which will see the, we, the speaker needs to make at least some statements which will which will stay with the audience you cannot expect that everything will stay with the audience so some statements are memorable hmm? so there should be some statement which stay with the audience <laughs> but there should not be any statements that the audience stays with them <laughs> <laughs> the audience is still stuck over there and doesn't go ahead hmm? so there are these this this is called sticky statements sticky statements means that they stick with the audience so if there is some some quotable statement hey that was a nice point remember that but that the audience sticks with them in the say, say sense that stays stuck in them now that is unhealthy so when krishna has made this point that among all the parts that are there the last verse ended with vedeshu yagneshu the pasu chaiva daneshu yat punya phalam pradishtam that if yagya dana tapai that is there whatever punya phala you get from that that and more you will get by the practice of yoga yogi param sthanam upaiti chadyam but yogi will get much more than that now this is a significantly strong statement to make if an ad suppose makes a statement that our medicine is the best medicine for curing cancer okay who says so say so i say so <laughs> well if you are the bad maker that's what you are going to say i'm not going to believe you so somebody else has to some neutral reviewers have to say that some doctors have to say that some patients who have actually been cured have to say that isn't it so now krishna will will basically elaborate on this statement now in one sense krishna has made a similar statement earlier i see chapter 7 and chapter 9 have many similarities and in one sense 647 and i believe it's 830 the last was way chapter 28 or 30 <coughs> so the last was the eighth chapter 28 yeah thank you Okay, this will go this. So, the last verse of the eighth chapter. What are the last verse of the sixth chapter? Among all yogis, the, the topmost is those who remember me. Now, Krishna is saying something similar, but slightly different. He says that the yogi attains the highest destination mm -hmm. among all other paths. So, it's a strong statement to make. Previously, Krishna has said in seven point one. Now, I will tell you a process by which you can come to this level of making your mind attached to me. so there is slightly different there the focus is krishna is telling how you can become the highest yogi but here krishna is telling why this is the highest yoga there are two different things although they are very related <coughs> but they are different now how to uh, how to become the highest yogi krishna has already outlined in that when he says bahunam janmanam ante you will come to the highest level mm. and also he has said that this is the easiest path tasyaham sulabha path but now he will elaborate on why this is the highest yoga so how to be the highest yogi that was the discussion over here and here the discussion is why this this is <coughs> bhakti yoga is the highest yoga Hmm. 
So having said this, now when we move forward in the discussion, let's see what Krishna does in this chapter. So before he can move ahead in describing how Bhakti Yoga is the highest yoga, for more than the half, half of the chapter, he in one sense has to re-establish or re-emphasize uh, re his own position because it's he who is the object of devotion. It is the he who is actually uplifts people through devotion. So now who can appreciate something that is spoken with love? <coughs> that is somebody who is non-envious. Now see what happens is, now there is a very, let's look at this from a common sense perspective, then we look for a scriptural perspective. Normally, if we think love, what is the opposite of love? Sorry? Well, let's, there can be many opposites of love, but let's look at it, love and its antonyms. Synonyms are same meaning, same meaning words. The opposite of love could be what? Hatred. Hatred, okay. I love you, I hate you. And any other opposite? Indifference. Indifference or apathy. You know, I don't care for you. Sometimes, many times people say, I don't care for you in such a way that they show that they care. <laughs> they're, they're like, I don't care for you. Mm -hmm. But so apathy means it's, I don't love you, I don't hate you, there's no emotion involved in it. Mm -hmm. Now, what could be another opposite of love? Any other opposites of love? Lust. Lust, okay. That's a... Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Broadly, we could say love is selfless, lust is selfish. Mm. Uh, love and lust, what is the key difference between them is? So basically hate means that I want to destroy. Love means I want to protect you. I want to care for you. I want to support you. Hate means I want to destroy you. I want to hurt you. Mm. So <coughs> apathy, So love, hate, this dynamic is between. Uh, it's more like what we want to do for to the other person. It's associated more with Oh. Let's try to understand the dynamic over here. How we um, deal with the other person. Hmm? How we want to deal with or how we deal with the other person. That's associated with hate. Now, apathy is associated with hmm, the emotional investment. That there is no there's a lot of emotional investment, there is no emotional investment. Now, love and lust, they are often associated with the, the reason for the connection. So, love and lust, what the difference is, say, generally love would be, and it start with lust. So, I need you, so I care for you. That is lust. I care for you, so I need you. That is the broad difference between lust and love. That I care for you and I cannot care for you if you are not in my life. Therefore, I need you. I need you, I need you in the sense that I need you to gratify my desires. Therefore, say, when there is lust, unless there is completely tamasic lust, where a person just exploits and uh, uh, abuses another person and just abandons them. That's, that's tamasic. But there, when there's ra normal rajasic <coughs> lust, it is that I care for you. But why do I care for you? Only because I need you to gratify my desires. And that's why if now, biologically speaking, that Krishna also says, Prajanas chasmi kandarpa. That among the causes for reproduction, I am the god of love, Cupid. That means the male-female attraction has a biological aspect to it. And it is that biological aspect 
that that eventually leads to reproduction mm -hmm. if uh, male female don't feel attracted to each other then there is no stimulation eventually for reproduction so that is so the male female relationship may have a component of lust but if that is all that is there so it's like the bhagavatam talks about this this is a i'm going off tangent but since you brought it up about lust we, we should so many times especially in the male female relationship the love lust difference it may not be that clear and sometimes in trying to avoid lust one may not be able to experience any love and one may mistake lust for love all those complexities are there but the way to differentiate is that in the male female relationship there are so especially in the reproductive act that is there uh, there are three aspects to it there is pleasure there is procreation and there is pair bonding now pair bonding is a biological term <coughs> but what does pair bonding mean i am talking about it from not a spiritual perspective simply from a biological perspective only the pair bonding means that the male and the female bond together and pair bonding is vital for humans because among all the species in nature no other species newborn requires as much care for as long as do human babies cows need some care other species also need uh, baby birds need some care but none of them need as much care for as long as do humans and that's why the pair bonding is very important that's why if the male and the female are not together then the progeny can't be taken care of so even from a biological perspective there is some pleasure in the in, in the reproductive act in sex but then it is it is meant for procreation and procreation or after procreation after procreation there has to be some pair bonding because it's not just okay you procreate and it's over to take care of the child after that so now the problem that comes is that among these three purposes the now even from this is these three are required even for material welfare if there are only these two there is pleasure and procreation then there is material disruption mm. that means we talk about how people may become single mothers and then no one to take care of them mm. now if there is only pleasure and no procreation then that is even unnatural and it's further disruptive unnatural means what that in the in nature the it's that the birth control pill or any kind of contracept contraception or abortion doesn't happen naturally so we have to unnaturally intervene in the process now of course from a spiritual perspective there is purification through <coughs> service so when parents come together to raise a child in the mood of service to the lord then when all of it comes together then this is where it becomes spiritually uplifting so normally speaking love would be where at least the relationship goes to the level of pair bonding then of course spiritually centered relationship means it's beyond pair bonding pair bonding that we come together so that we can build a home together we can build a home for krishna in which krishna's children can appear and grow to be krishna's devotees that's the purpose but when only pleasure is sought without the purpose of procreation without the purpose of pair bonding without the purpose of purification through service then that is that is just you could say raw lust nothing more than it and that kind of lust is is opposed to love so that is based on the reason for relationship now we were dis discussing a different point hmm.
the point we are discussing is what is the difference between love what is the opposite of love now one opposite of love which is often not thought of that way is envy it is why is it envy basically it's how we view others glories when there is love the others glory brings happiness when there is envy the others glory brings unhappiness anger isn't it so krishna when he says repeatedly that arjuna i am speaking to you because you are non envious what he means by that is that i am speaking to you because you will be not unhappy or agitated to hear my glories you will be happy to hear my glories now say for example you know we you know we win some award or we do something wonderful and then we want to come and tell our family that's that's that is our our people want to share our joys with them but if say in our family we have a sibling who is very jealous of us then what happens is our telling that okay i want this that will only trigger the jealousy then now of course if we really have a bad relationship with our sibling then we'll deliberately tell that <laughs> to make them more jealous <laughs> but if we have a good relationship then we would not speak about our success relate getting relating with this point you know that if we know that somebody is jealous of us and it's unfortunate if this happens in a husband wife relationship the nowadays with both the husband and wife pursuing careers then either way if the husband is very successful the wife can feel very insecure and especially if the wife earns more than the husband <laughs> then the husband feels hurt husband cannot celebrate his wife's success the husband feels jealous of his wife's success so then that can lead to a lot of problems so here you understand how love and envy are opposite when there is love we celebrate the other's success brings celebration but when there is envy the other's success brings agitation not celebration <coughs> so krishna he starts his chapter by saying that anasum yave i'll speak this this to you because you are non envious now we may say uh, this is the idea of envy towards god this is generally we have envy towards those in our league isn't it <laughs> say we don't feel envious of those say, we may feel envious of somebody who is our equal even even bhakti you know, if we are doing some service and somebody who has come more or less with us does a better service then we feel envious but somebody who is very senior to us we may feel awe we feel amazement but we don't feel envy over them so why is this term used so god is completely out of our league unless we are out of our mind <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so why would this idea of envy towards god come mm -hmm. see it's that so that envy may not exactly be similar to the kind of envy we have towards our equals but basically if hearing our glories so hearing god's glories not our glories hearing god's glories makes us agitated and skeptical and cynical then that is an indication that there is some emotion similar to envy so that envy may not exactly be in the sense so what happens is when we hear god's glory generally when we hear god's glories we want to challenge it not so that okay this doesn't make sense to me i want to understand it but no this is not right and i'll prove it is not right so when somebody wants to repeatedly look for reasons to falsify god's glories to counter god's glories 
that is a sign of envy. Say for example, somebody who is equal to us, they give a very good class and everybody is praising them. And then you say, what a wonderful class he gave. Say, but have you seen how much prasad he eats? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is, I can't deny that he gave a good class, but don't think he is a pure devotee. He has no control over his senses. Huh? So we try to pull the person down. So what happens when envy is there? So envy, in one sense, it might seem unnatural because God is out of our league. Unless, as I said, we are mad. Unless we are out of our mind. But still, that envy is possible in the sense that we want to challenge or counter God's glories. And challenge and counter, sometimes we may challenge so that we can get better understanding. You know, Arjuna shows how to do that kind of challenge is when he says Katham in the fourth chapter he asks Katham etad vijaniya How am I to understand that you give this knowledge to Sun God? <coughs> So that is inquiry, but it is a submissive inquiry. It is, it is not a, hey, who do you think you are kidding? Yeah. You can speak nonsense and you think you can get away with it. I am not a fool. He is not, he's not <laughs> dismissing Krishna. So, it is basically challenge and counter God's goal is to, to try to, to falsify them, to pull God down, to deny God his position. So, if we don't want, if that is our attitude, we want to challenge and counter God's glories, then it is best. Krishna says, I won't speak my glory. That will only agitate you. That will only alienate you for, from me. So, then Krishna doesn't speak his glories. But Krishna is saying, Arjuna, to you, I'll speak my glories because you are non-envious. Now, Krishna speaks many things, but uh, I'll focus on one particular theme in Krishna's analysis over here. That is, does God control everything? What do you think? Does God control everything? Okay. Yes. How many of you say yes? yes? Okay. How many of you say no? How many of you say I don't know? <laughs> okay. okay. How many of you say none of the above? <laughs> okay. Now, you can say of course one of the definitions of God is that He is the Supreme Controller, Parameshwara. So yes, we could say because He is the Supreme Controller. But then, we could say no, because we all have free will, isn't it? So, see, God is the supreme controller, but the question is, is he the sole controller? Among various hierarchies of controls, he is the supreme controller. But is he the only controller of everything that happens? If this difference between this as supreme controller, it's not the same as the sole controller. So, now if you see, if we say God is the uh, sole controller, then there is no possibility for free will. And if we say there is another problem, if we say God is the supreme control, see, then is he controlling our actions? Is he controlling our choices? Then when you say he's controlling, is he when then when we do bad things, why are we held responsible for those bad things? 
if it is he who is controlling us and making us do those bad things. Like say, uh, if some crime has happened, some murder has happened, some, and the police can't find anyone. So they find some innocent person, or they arrest that person, and they take that person to where the corpse is. The police place a gun in that person's hand, and they wear a glove, and they press the button. So what happens is, the bullet is shot from that gun, and the fingers of this innocent person come over. And the police say, you are the murderer. And they frame him. Now, we would consider this to be barbaric. This would be horrible abuse of power. So basically, if we say we know have, have no free will, then we are saying God is like this kind of police person. God makes us do bad things and then punishes us for doing bad things. Isn't it? Isn't it? So, so basically the denial of free will makes God evil. Denial of free will. So, the denial of free will <coughs> makes God evil. So, free will and evil. So, the, so it's important to understand that while God controls everything, that does not necessarily mean that he is the cause of every single action that happens in the world. He's obviously the cause, Sarva Karana Karanam. We have heard that, isn't it? He is the cause of all causes. Yes, he is the cause of all causes. But is he the cause of all effects? Now, what is the difference between the cause of all causes and the cause of all effects? Let's try to understand this difference. Say, for example, now, Draupadi was disrobed by whom? Dushyasan. Now, when Draupadi was disrobed by Dushyasan, Krishna intervened and made her robe unlimited. And that's why the disrober got exhausted, but the robe didn't get exhausted. That was the extraordinary miracle that happened. So Krishna intervened to protect Draupadi. But can we say that while Krishna was providing Draupadi robe from other side, it was Krishna who was taking off Draupadi's robe through Dushyasana's means? Obviously not, isn't it? It was Dushasan who was doing that horrendous thing. Now, Dushasan's strength came from Krishna. So, the cause of all causes is Krishna. But how he uses that strength is determined by his free will. So, he is not the cause of all effects. So, he is the cause of all causes means Dushasan's strength. Now, he could have used that strength for anything. Hmm? Dushasan's strength comes from Krishna, but Dushasan's disrobing of Draupadi, that does not come from Krishna. That comes from his own free will and his misuse of his free will. So the scriptures give the example that the clouds are the cause of all vegetation on the earth. But which specific vegetation grows where? That is not determined by the clouds. That is determined by the specific kind of seeds that are there on the earth. So the rain, uh, the clouds or the rain we could say, the rain is the cause of all causes. But not the cause of all effects. The rain is what enables through the ground for vegetation to grow. But the specific vegetation that grows where depends on what is sown over there in the past. So now let's look at this differentiation. <coughs> this differentiation makes one contradiction in the Gita. So, or apparent contradiction. In 9.4, Krishna is saying, Matsthani Sarva Bhutani. Matsthani. You can say, all living beings are situated in me. 
and then in the very next line, next chapter, just two lines later, you know what does Krishna say? Exactly opposite. Nacha matsthani bhutari. Now normally, if somebody contradicts themselves, they'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry, it is a slip of tongue." So, okay, from here I am going to Mumbai. Oh, actually no, I am going to Delhi. So that's a slip of tongue. We correct it. And we are a little embarrassed if we make a mistake. But from Krishna, after he contradicts himself, there is no embarrassment. What he says is, Pashyame Yoga Maishwaram. Pashyame. It's like, behold this. Normally, if we make a mistake and contradict ourselves, we hope that nobody noticed it. <laughs> but Krishna is highlighting it. See this. So, Krishna is not embarrassed. Krishna is saying, see it. And what is this? This is Yogam Aishwaram. So, Aishwara is what? Opulence. Yogam. What does Yoga mean? Connection. The, the magnificence of my connection. The word Yoga in the Gita has many different meanings as we discussed earlier. But now let's consider a fundamental, dif fundamentally different category of meaning. Yoga essentially means connection. And normally, we use that to refer to, say, the soul's connection with God. And then there are various ways to connect with God. That is Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Dhyan Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. How the soul connects with God. But Yoga, if it means connection, it can mean something else also. It can also refer to <coughs> God's connection with the world. At how God connects with the world. And when Krishna is using that over here, he is using the word, word in that sense. Pashyame Yoga Maishwaram. Just behold the magnificent, the mystical nature of my connection with the world. That I am sustained, that I sustain the world. And I say, the world is in me and yet the world is not in me. Matsthani. The world is in me, the world is not in me. Now what does it mean? In the next verse, Krishna will give an example of that. So how God connects with the world. That is the meaning of yoga in this particular context in 9.5. So Krishna is using yogam aishwaram. So let's look at the next verse which will explain this or reconcile this contradiction. So Krishna is giving a metaphor. Like I said, whenever the principles are given, especially the principles are difficult to understand then some examples need to be given to illustrate the principles. So Yatha Akash, Akash is the sky. Sthito Nityam is situated always. What? Vayu. Vayu is wind. Vayu Sarvatrago Mahan. Sarvatrago means the Vayu can go in, the wind can go in various directions. Yet it is situated inside the sky. Yatha Akasha Sthito Nityam. Yatha Akasha Sthito Nityam. Vayu Sarvatrago Mahan. Vayu Sarvatrago Mahan. Tatha. So generally in, in Sanskrit there are these couples. So Yatha and Tatha, like Yada, Tada, we discussed it. So Yatha and Tatha. So just as similarly, Tatha, Sarvani Bhutani. Similarly, all living beings, Matsthani Tya Upadharya. All living beings are situated in me. Tatha, Sarvani Bhutani. Tatha, Sarvani Bhutani. Matsthani Tya Upadharya. Matsthani Tya Upadharya. So, Let's try to understand this metaphor. Mm. But before that, let's recite the words together once again. Yatha akashistito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan Tatha sarvani bhutani masthani nityam dharaya So here, Krishna is saying that if we consider the sky to be like an upside down bowl 
and within that there is say a gust of wind uh, the wind the sky and the wind uh, the wind can itself move upward it can move downward it can move leftward it can move rightward it can move in laterally in various directions so the wind is free to move in various directions but it cannot move beyond the upside down ball of the sky now of course you can say the sky there is no such thing as the sky is endless space but krishna is using a metaphor drawn from our conventional understanding of things and if you consider the sky to be like upside down ball so so uh, this is basically the domain of the sky that is the domain of our free will and the sky is the domain of god's controllership so everybody everybody by their past karma gets some power gets some position this is another word for this is kshetra we have a sphere of influence now that within that sphere of influence we can do what we want so dushasan had a particular position and within that position he could do whatever he wanted but that position won't last for long that position will be there for some time and during that time he can do whatever he wants in that scope he can do whatever he wants say some if police person or abuses their power now within their their police station within their jurisdiction maybe nobody can challenge them but if their boss comes to inquire then it's a problem now imagine somebody is a dictator head of a country they have no boss about them but maybe that person can terrorize their citizens but only till either another country attacks or till that person themselves die if they try to go and similarly terrorize somebody in any other country it won't work so this kshetra is in terms of both space and time that is the limitation now within this kshetra what we do is up to us so when bad people do bad things it is not krishna making them do bad things it is they doing bad things by misusing their power and krishna will later say that udasina i stay as if detached i observe and when their karma runs out they get their punishment so now this kshetra that is there different people may in the same lifetime say if somebody is born in a royal family then maybe as a child they have a certain level of influence now as that person becomes a prince maybe their influence increases as this person becomes a king that person that person's influence increases more and more and as that person starts becoming older maybe their influence starts decreasing maybe that person becomes obedridden their influence becomes lesser still and then when they die there is zero influence hmm? so a person's influence may increase or decrease over a lifetime but at the same time we could say so this is the kshetra changing with time but it's also possible that in the same place there could be different people with different degrees of influence say in a in a school a student may have a certain level of influence maybe the class monitor do they use the word monitor or what is the word used nowadays monitor okay so the monitor may have certain level of influence the teacher may have certain level of influence the principal may have the principal influence the maximum influence so each person will have a different degree of kshetra and within that kshetra now sometimes in some schools the principal may be very dictatorial the principal may not only 
uh, abuse the students, the students may abuse the teachers also. But they can do it only as long as they are the principal. That power is going to be temporary. So when Krishna is saying all living beings are situated in me, but they are not situated. What that means is they are situated within my ultimate controllership. But their specific actions are not controlled by me. Now, this is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that, that any action that we want to do, we cannot do it without Krishna's will. Right now, I want to speak. I don't even know how my voice box works. So, I just desire to speak and the appropriate sound is coming out. So, in one sense, we can do nothing without Krishna's sanction. But still, there is a difference again. When we talk about God's uh, sanction, okay, not God's role in human actions. So that role can range from what we are doing is God's intention and what we are doing is God's permission. Now, permission means you want to do it. And I'll let you do it. So, the permission can sometimes even be a concession. This is not good, but you want to do it, I'll let you do it. Now, nothing happened without God, without God having a role in the action. But everything that happens is not God's intention. When bad people do bad things, that's not God's intention. That is God, do, God letting the person do the bad thing. So, for example, Krishna's intention was to have a peace plan with Duryodhan. Mm -hmm. Now, what is Krishna's permission concession? Rejection of that peace plan. Uh, that proposal or plan. Duryodhan wanted to reject that. Did Krishna want that? You know, Krishna came with the plan and Duryodhana rejected that. So, when Krishna comes in the material world, Krishna may not always act as if he is God, as the supreme person. So, he may let people do something which they want, that's how they want to do it. But then, if he rejects the peace proposal, then there has to be a consequence, there will be a war. And in the war, eventually he perishes. So, there is this range, the spectrum of what God's role is in our life. Now, in the context of the Gita, what it immediately means is the Pandavas, many bad things have happened to them. The worst for them probably is the disrobing of Draupadi and the, the defrauding of their entire kingdom from them. But many bad things have happened. So now, it's important to recognize that there is a common saying everything that happens is good. There is this, in many places in India, we have this Gita Sar. Jo hua, wo achcha hua. Jo ho raha hai, wo achcha ho raha hai. Jo hone wala hai, wo bhi achcha hi hoga. Now, they say it is the Sar of the Gita, but Sare Gita mein ye nahi hai. <laughs> in the entire Gita, you know, I have read the Gita dozens and dozens of times. I recited the Gita hundreds of times. I have friends who have recited it. I talk with Gita scholars from other traditions also. Um, of traditions and others. No one has, uh, no one has found any shloka which comes anywhere near this. What to speak of say this? <laughs> and it is a nice sounding sentiment. But it's not the teaching of the Gita. And it's not only not the teaching of the Gita, it is also not philosophically correct. In fact, you know, bad things happen in life. You know, it's, a, it's a horrendous thing to tell someone. Krishna, when he met Draupadi, after uh, she had been attempted to be disrobed, and then uh, they were in the forest in exile, Krishna went there to meet Draupadi. At that time, Krishna didn't tell Panchali Jo Hua Acha Hua. You know, if something like that has happened to a person, it's a horrendous thing to have happened. 
So what does it mean then? See, there is a difference between everything that happens is good versus everything is for good. Now, is for good means what? It is meant for a good purpose. Or you can qualify it even more. Everything that happens can be for good. Can be for good means if we see something positive in it, if we respond in a positive way to it, then it can be for good. But what happens, it's, it can sometimes be bad. <coughs> and many things can be bad. Terrible. So it is, if everything that happens is good, we say, then again that means there is no room for bad people to do bad things. That's a denial of free will. And it also goes against human experience. In some religious traditions, this idea is that everything that happens is good. Now, not I, when I say some religious traditions, I'm not saying a particular religion because you know, each religion is complex. Say, for example, if say Hindus say like this, you know, Hindus are so many denominations, Christians are so many denominations, Muslims are so many denominations, and sometimes. What, now they, of course, all Christians, all Muslims, each religion will have some common beliefs. But within those common beliefs, there are a wide variety of different beliefs. But in UK, there was a court case against God. Not against God, particularly, that you expect God, that, that was like, there was this movie, OMG, in which the person tried to, uh, the protagonist tried to challenge God. I wrote a book about that called OMG, re-answering the questions. So, but... This was more against the very idea of God. So this petitioner, he said that the, the idea of God, the idea of a good God should be declared by the government to be immoral and illegal. The idea of good, good God. He says, why? He says, considering the gravity and severity of human suffering, hmm, the very idea of a good God is an insult to human intelligence and human dignity. When you see so much suffering, how can there be a good God? And so now the point is that if we consider, if we claim that every single thing that happens is God's will. Now we can say, yeah, not a blade of grass moves without God's will. We say that. But will has different meanings. The will can mean intention, will can also mean permission. So not everything that happens is what God wants to happen. It is what also God allows to happen at times. <coughs> so when Duryodhan, for example, insulted Vidura, at that time, when did Duryodhan insult Vidura? Just before the war was about to start, Vidura tried repeatedly try to, to make Duryodhan see sense and when Duryodhan wouldn't see sense he finally spoke to Dhritarashtra he said O king if you want to save your kingdom <coughs> you should reject your son otherwise he will cause the destruction of all your children in your entire dynasty <coughs> now this was like a desperate last ditch attempt by Vidura and Duryodhan could bear it no more Duryodhan is lashed out and says, get out! Who asked you to come here? Who do you think you are? You are a traitor. Now, when Vidura spoke this, Duryodhan's words hurt Vidura. But what hurt him much more was the Dhritarashtra's silence. When we are criticized, the words of our critics hurt us. But what hurts us even more is the silence of our friends. And that's when Vidura decided, I can't stay here. So, now when Vidura left, what did he think? Duryodhan's words were spoken by his own misuse of free will. But Vidura thought, here is an opportunity for me to go away and not have to fight on the side of Duryodhan and Dhritarashtra against the Pandavas. And that's how he left. So the idea is, he saw that this is an opportunity for me 
to go to the go on pilgrimage to meet with the sages to gain more wisdom to gain more purification he could have joined the side of the pandavas and he was confident that the pandavas didn't need him they would destroy duryodhan and his brothers he still had hope that dhritarashtra could be saved and he rather than blaming dhritarashtra to be so attached he thought that maybe i need more wisdom and purification so that i will be able to communicate with dhritarashtra in a way that he will understand so he decided to go to the sages and hear from them so so everything that happens is it's not we can't really say what duryodhan did was good duryodhan had a bad intention and the bad thing disrespect and publicly insulting someone who was from his father's generation but by vidura's choice of how he responded to it good came out of it so after talking about this principle about how krishna relates with various things in the world then krishna will say there are different kinds of people something similar to the third chapter where he says there is a spectrum of humanity so how people approach him now we are talked till now in terms of specific actions somebody may do something which is in harmony with krishna's will that's what krishna wants us to do intention somebody may do something which is which is what krishna allows to do <coughs> so range of humanity so krishna will talk about how there are different people and these different people they will act in different ways so first he starts at the bottom 11 12 he talks about the demoniac avajananti ma mudha manushim tanmash now in this particular category he also puts the impersonalist those who consider his form to be to be what to be maya now we say how can impersonalist be called demoniac they are also renounced people they are also spiritual people they are also evolved isn't it so so that's why the word impersonalist has to be understood carefully there are two categories of impersonalists there are brahmavadis and there are mayavadis now what is the brahma brahmavadis idea this is a major very important concept so that there is the impersonal side and then the personal side it is just that i am attracted to the person in person this is my preference now the person may exist some people will be attracted to it i don't care about that so this is the notion of the brahmavadis and many people today who seem to be in person i want to merge most of them are either brahmavadis are mostly brahmavadis so what are mayavadis mayavadis say that the impersonal is not just the highest reality they they go on to say this is the only reality and then they say the personal is what it is a convenient <coughs> fiction <coughs> what do you mean by convenient fiction and actually in your condition stage you can't think of that ultimate reality without any qualities without any form without any activities so for such less intelligent people like you you can worship the person you can worship the person but so as long as you are less intelligent okay this is for less as long as people are less intelligent they worship the person but once they become more intelligent and what happens is they recognize the whole personal is maya and this is the only reality so basically The, somebody wanting to merge in the brahman doesn't make them a mayavadi 
and that is not offensive to Krishna. This, so in the 12th chapter, when there was a discussion, some of you may were there, 12.1 to 7, we discussed this. There Krishna was talking about Brahmavadis. They will also come to me. They will attain my impersonal effulgence. But the Mayavadis, they deny the reality of Krishna's form at all. Entirely. And in fact, some of them, they, it, it just is not just a philosophical conception for them. It's also like a practical reality. So for example, their idea is, you sit in front of your favorite deity. Whichever you want, Ishtadev, whatever it is. You just meditate on that. Sit and meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate. And then, what is the success of your meditation? By the power of your meditation, that deity will crumble into power. And that is when you will go beyond the form to the formless. So it's like the very object you are worshipping, you are longing when the object of worship will be destroyed. And that is the success of my meditation. And of course, if there is a solitary meditation, then what happens? Unfortunately, some seekers. Now, again, I'm not generalizing that all Mayavadis will ever do like this. But there are cases where some impersonalists, some Mayavadis specifically, and what they do is everybody wants cheap success. They sit for solitary meditation and they smash the deity to powder. And they say, oh, the deity crumbled to powder by my meditation. I have realized, I have become enlightened now. So this becomes quite diabolical. So it is this condemnation of Krishna's personal form as Maya, that is the defining characteristic of a Mayavadi that Krishna considers demoniac. So the demons may try to kill Krishna. So demons may try to destroy Krishna and the, these Advaitavadis, these specific Advaitavadis, they try to destroy Krishna's personal form. And that's why it becomes toxic. Now, having said this, most people who even go to Advaitic Mayavadi organization, they don't even know about this kind of thing. <laughs> Just go there because it feels good and there's some nice atmosphere is there and some many other reasons. Are there, are there toxic Mayavadis? Of course there are, but they are a small minority and even among the Mayavadis, uh, many of them are actually, they, they have this idea that, uh, you know, everybody has to naturally evolve according to their paths. So they say that, okay, if you are on the path of worshipping uh, Vishnu or Krishna, you continue on that path. They don't really, their ideas, you just continue. Uh, their ideas, no, no, again, no, not all Mayavadis are like this. But they say, oh, you just continue on your path. Mm. So, this, we have to understand, there's a difference between Mayavad philosophy and specific people who have Mayavadi conceptions or that who are like ruled or defined by those Mayavadi conceptions. But this is what Krishna is very strongly reproaching. Now, after that, Krishna goes to the other extreme and 13-14, he talks about the pure devotees. Hmm. Then, he will talk about three different categories of people. Ikatvena, Prutaktvena, Bahudha, Vishwatomukham. So this, these three categories Krishna mentions in, in the 15th verse. Vishwato Mukham. So what does this mean basically? Ekatvena is those who seek oneness. So it's, it's in this very chapter Krishna is differentiating between the Mayavadis and those who seek oneness. So these those who seek oneness, Krishna will talk about them in the chapter 12. Pruthaktvena. Ekatvena Prutakvena Ekatvena Prutakvena Bahuda Vishwato Mukham. Actually, there's a slight mistake over here. Bahuda Prutakvena Bahuda is one category. Prutakvena means that differentiated into many. So this is the Devata worship. 
This is what Krishna will talk about soon after this. He has he will talk about this from 9 23 to 25. Basically, he talks about this from 916 onwards till 25. But primarily here, he is also earlier talk about it from 720 to 23. And then Vishwato Mukham. Vishwato Mukham refers to the universal form, the Virat Rupa. And this is going to be talked about in chapter 11, which chapter 11 and 12 we already discussed. So Krishna is giving the spectrum of humanity over here. That there are many different living beings who have different characteristics. So and Krishna, Krishna is not condemning any of them over here. Ekatvena, those who seek oneness, those who worship the one absolute truth in many different forms, and those who worship the universe itself. Now, many scientists, if they are not aggressively atheists, they can broadly be considered to be nature worshippers. Because they basically consider the laws of nature to be supreme. So in some ways, uh, this is similar to the Shakta system of worship. In the Shakta system, specific, Shakta is associated with the word Shakti. Now specifically, they worship the goddess and they do the puja. Now scientists don't do a puja like that. But if we go beyond the specific rituals of worship to the underlying worldview, the worldview is that nature itself is sacred. So the idea is that Vishwato Mukham, scientists can fall in this category, not all of them. Some, some or many scientists may fall in this category where they consider nature itself to be the object of worship. So Einstein's God falls somewhere between this nature worship and uh, deism. So this nature worship is often called as pantheism. Pantheism is basically pan is everything like a pan India initiative. That means it's an initiative that spread all over India. So pantheism is everything is God. Everything refers to everything in nature that is God. So polytheism is what? There are many gods. So, so when many scientists, when there are whole books written about what exactly was Einstein's conception of God. Einstein didn't believe in God. He made many different statements. So he, he was certainly not a theist in the normal sense of the word. The, you can use theist generically as one who believes in God. So he definitely believed in God, so you can call him a theist. But if you consider theist as God as the creator and the controller. Hmm? So his, his idea of God was somewhere between deism and pantheism. Pantheism in nature is God and deism is God is the creator but not the controller. So now of course we may take some quotes of Einstein and we will talk about him as uh, as believing in God and that's fair enough he did make those statements but if we overuse or over rely on those statements then and see in the west people are quite skeptical mm -hmm. and we have to be prepared as India has also become westernized that one devotee he recently wrote to me saying that you know he talked about this quote about how Einstein is Einstein believed in God and immediately one student he brought out four or five quotes where Einstein says I don't believe in God so they asked him you know I didn't know about all this I said yes it's true Einstein made both kinds of statements you know it's not that belief in God is necessarily like a static thing just because you believe in God one time does not necessarily mean that you will believe in God throughout your life he went through phases in his life and especially he was a Jew and the Jews were horrendously persecuted uh, and when the Holocaust happened, you know, that also had a, left a psychological scar on him. So he survived, he got sanctuary in, in America, but then he also had a guilty conscience that he was the person who gave the idea to the American government to make the atom bomb. And when it was used, he was shocked at the amount of destruction that it caused. So there's a his life was also quite traumatic. So has he made those statements? He believed in God. Of course, he's made those statements. 
Has he made the other kind of statement? He has made those kind of statements. So now what was his defining characteristic throughout his life? He was a scientist, he was enquiring. And he went through different phases. So it's like the scientists have believed in God. Does that mean that they have believed in God the same way as a devotee who does Ma Manu Smaritya? No, not necessarily. So these statements can be used, but people's conception of God changes. It can evolve, it can devolve with time. So moving forward now, we have, uh, I'd like to discuss three concepts. Each of them I'll try to discuss briefly. So I'll talk about, I talked about Advaitavad. We have talked about Vishwarupa already. Let's talk about polytheism now. Polytheism is the worship of the Devtas. So basically, if you consider the conception of the divine, now when the, I'll start from outside framework today, and then we'll come to the inside framework. Outside framework means, when the Europeans colonialists came to India, they came from the Abrahamic religions, mostly Christianity. And these are monotheistic. They are proudly monotheistic. They say, we believe only in one God and no God except that one God. Abrahamic religions. And now, before these Abrahamic religions took hold in Europe and the Middle East, before that, there was, a, especially in Europe, there was the Greco-Roman conceptions. Now, poly, they were polytheistic. There are Zeus and Aphrodite and all these different kinds of gods within. So, these are the Greco-Roman tradition. Polytheism means there are many gods. And in the Greco-Roman tradition, all these different gods are fighting for turf. Fighting for turf. Each is trying to prove that I am better than others and trying to become supreme. So now when they came to India, initially they saw so many temples and so many images. It was bizarre. They said, it's obvious. It's polytheism. So one western scholar, he said that uh, Hinduism is not a religion, it is a museum of religions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, what was it? There's a popular book on Hinduism. It is, just, it's, it is popularity is good, its content is not so good. So there, this is the Indian, an American is asking the Indian, oh, why do you people worship so many gods? And he said, we believe in keeping backups. <laughs> <laughs> So, the idea of multiple gods is bewildering. But then, there were some, some Western thinkers also who observed a little bit more carefully and they saw one thing very strange that is, whichever temple you used to go to, it is almost as if that god is worshipped as the supreme. Although nominally you may say this god is in charge of this or that. It is almost as each god is worshipped as if is the supreme. So, I just found it very difficult to uh, fit this idea into their conceptions. So, actually speaking, is monotheism and polytheism are western categories and the Vedic tradition doesn't actually fit into this so easily. So, it's like... Uh, if at all we want to use a Vedic categor Western categorization to describe it, it is like polymorphic, multi-level, by monotheism. <laughs> what well, let me explain each of these terms. See, first of all, why by monotheism? By because in our tradition, God is not just one person. God is a couple. Radha Krishna, Sita Ram, Lakshmi Naray. So it's a divine couple. And both of them are considered supreme. Both of them are considered divine. Although there is a relationship of, uh, you could say Shakti and Shakti Man, worship and worship. But still both of them are considered worship. So it's not just monotheism. It's by monotheism. And then it's polymorphic. Morphic means what? Forms. Many forms. 
so polymorphic <coughs> is that there are many forms so ram sita sorry ram uh, ram uh, krishna narayan narsimha vamana all the vishnu tattva they are vishnu advaitam achyutam anadim ananta roopam so that ananta roopam is polymorphic and this the divine male female sita ram that's what talks about the um, actually it's ram sita sita ram whatever normally the sita is referred to first so but that is by monotheism now what is this idea this is multi level so in the western tradition so the western idea of polytheism was that there is one true god there is one true god that's only god and there are all other false gods and the idea is for the glorification of this one true god all other false gods not only are they put down they have to be destroyed and this idea is very central the idea is in the old testament it says your god is a jealous god hmm? jealous god means your god does not like it if you worship anyone else and because of this uh, right from the old testament itself the idea that the worshiping of false gods should not only be given up but it should be just completely stopped even by force that is very much a central part of these religious traditions is at least in terms of their historical textual narrative <coughs> so in the old testament whenever any old testament king conquers a particular kingdom they will go and they will destroy the temples of the false gods now in the now jesus did not conquer anything jesus was more like a brahmanical preacher then a conquer and then a ruler uh, but christians did not later on they got power did the same thing and this idea of establishing the glory of the one true god by destroying all other false gods is what was taken to its maximum in terms of political action by islam now um, mohammed lived in mecca then he went to medina and then he came back to mecca of its force when he conquered that place the first thing that he did was he destroyed all the idols over there and that set up a tradition now for them now we may say now okay all those might have been idols what we worship are deities but in their tradition you remember i talked about transcendence and immanence mm. that god existing beyond nature and god existing within nature so in their tradition there is no i conception of god existing within nature especially in terms of god manifesting in some form so their idea is any form that you worship it is a false god now we may say no no this is pranapatishta has been done and this has been this is based on scriptural scriptural description but for that it's it not our scripture anyway your scripture is just false so all the description of god is also false so uh, this, so the idea of destroying and stopping the worship of false gods is intrinsic to their tradition because their idea is all false gods they are just manifestations of the devil of the shaitan satan and they say stopping satanic worship is integral to worshiping the one true god and that's why say now in islamic rule all muslims are definitely not extremists but destroying the temples of false gods is not an extremist islamic teaching it is very much a central part of the very conception of the divine within islam in fact uh, among all sins 
the the which allah they say will never forgive you know you can rape you can murder allah will forgive all that but the one sin that allah will not forgive is if you do idolatry if you that's called shark that if you associate anything material with allah with god you equate allah with anything material that is the greatest insult to allah so now is this what everyday muslims believe rarely just like most hindus don't know hindu philosophy <laughs> so similarly most muslims don't know muslim philosophy and you know when you say muslim philosophy also so there is something in the quran but there are so many as a whole tradition of islamic scholars and they all have emphasized different things at different times so so it's so a what i'm talking about is two different things over here one is in terms of islamic ideology this is not a fringe teaching that the worship of the false god needs to be stopped and if you have political power use that political power to stop but does that mean that that's what muslims will do today not necessarily most likely not unless they get majority power but even then it's not necessary that they will do it like you will see that even in the place where in the middle east muslims have probably un have practically unquestioned power but recently even in in i think in uae or was it uae a hindu temple was built and modi went there to inaugurate the temple so there is a difference between how people live in today's world and what is taught in scripture now of course in scripture also lots of things are taught which things people take up that depends on them the, the point i am making over here is not to talk about islam and its conception of deity because deity worship is a whole different subject i have written a whole book on this topic called idol worship or ideal worship but the point i am making over here is that this categorical difference between the true god and the false gods now this is the polytheistic tradition the vedic tradition is there is there is bhagwan and then there are devatas and if you see how it is the bhagwan is like the pm and the devatas are like the ministers so it is not that for the glorification of the prime minister the ministers have to be destroyed so this is a completely different vision it's a completely different vision <coughs> now we generally focus on this particular metaphor of the relationship between the, the prime minister and the chief minister and how the devatas are assisting the supreme lord now can sometimes the devatas get some ego issues by which they think i am the greatest that's always possible but that does not mean that is how they are intrinsically situated those roles are not like that so now the devatas have two roles one is an administrative role where they assist krishna mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now along with an administrative role they also have a role let's in a role in cosmic administration but they also have a role in terms of worship that krishna arranges for the devatas to be worshiped i'll explain why he does that shortly so in the in the abrahamic religions in the old testament there's a story of the prodigal son has any of you heard the story yes i think all of you heard the prodigal son and the idea is that there is the kingdom or the village or the whatever you want to say in which the father is staying and the son goes away from there the son goes far away suffers and then returns and the father welcomes him back and this is shown as a sign of god's great love that even if we abandon him when we turn back to him he welcomes us back and that's definitely a sign of god's love but in the vedic tradition god is not is waiting but god is not just waiting for us to return to him god is working for us to return to him and what does working mean that means say if this is separate this to here so if this is the father's kingdom and the prince the son has gone out of this kingdom then what happens is 
the father sends an assistant a minister and that minister says you know you are suffering over here you are not getting good job you are not being paid well you come and work for me and now if the father himself goes back the son is not yet on good terms with the father the son will not come back so what does the father as the king do he sends a minister and he doesn't tell the minister to tell that you know i am this i am working for this king he says you know just you tell about your power your position how you can reward him and then by that what happens is the son comes back now the son comes back into the father's kingdom and here there is the prince and then here there is the minister so the prince is not yet back home but the prince is in the father's kingdom so these ministers are like the devtas so for those who are not able to worship krishna krishna doesn't say you worship me or you go to hell if you can't worship me i am not concerned about my glorification my primary concern is your protection your elevation so if you can't worship me at least worship a representative of me and come closer to me so if we consider this is krishna <coughs> and say this is the jiva this is the soul then this is the devata so the best is at the soul worships krishna and krishna reward the soul so this is this is bhakti so this is bhakti and this is the best hmm? but for those who are not ready for this what krishna does is so the dev the, the, the soul worships the devta and the devta gives the result but the important thing is so this is what we can call as the <coughs> devta worship now in this worship of the devtas the important thing to understand is that krishna is not just a bystander what krishna does is actually krish it is krishna it is it is krishna who gives power to the devtas to fulfill the desires of the worshipers and it is krishna who gives shraddha it is krishna who gives faith to the individual to the worship the devtas so this is sri so krishna tells us don't be envious but this sri so krishna is saying be non envious krishna is also showing how much i am non envious that is if i am the boss in a company and somebody comes in the same company and works and calls somebody else the boss how ignorant can you be you don't know my position but krishna is is like i am happy you are unemployed at least you are gainfully employed so krishna's concern is primarily our elevation not his own glorification now of course now in this particular point if we go back to the seventh chapter of the gita this is what krishna is saying so the, as i mentioned there are similarities in the seventh and the ninth chapter so it's interesting i'll i'll talk about two verses which broadly illustrate this point so let's look at this verse yo 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 is typical yadya yada yad 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 like that whoever yam yam whichever tanum is form bhaktaha with devotion shraddhaya with faith architum ichchati one who desires to worship यो यो याम याम तनु भक्त श्रद्धया तस्य तस्य एंड टू दैट पर्सन 
अचलाम श्रद्धा श्रद्धा इज फेथ अचला इज स्ट्रॉन्ग नॉट शेकिंग ताम एव आई इट इज टू दैट पर्सन आई गिव विद धाम हम इट इज आई हु गिव दैट फेथ सो कृष्ण इज सेइंग आई गिव फेथ इवन टू द वर्शिपर ऑफ द देवताज तस्य तस्याचलाम श्रद्धाम तस्य तस्याचलाम श्रद्धाम ताम एव विदधाम्यहम ताम एव विदधाम्यहम सो दिस इज द काइंडनेस ऑफ कृष्ण नाउ आई विल टेक वन मोर वर्स एंड यू विल सी हाउ डिपेंडिंग ऑन पर्सपेक्टिव थिंग्स कैन बी explained in opposite ways so this is from the so this is the 9th chapter we are discussing ye pya anya devata bhakta those who worship other devatas those those who are the worship of other devatas ye jante shraddhayan vitaha they worship with faith te pi mame va konte they are also worshiping me yajantya avidhi purvakam avidhi purvakam means improperly vidhi is scripture vidhi purvakam means properly according to scripture avidhi purvakam means not properly with improper understanding ye pyanya devata bhakta ye pyanya devata bhakta yajante shraddhayan vitaha yajante shraddhayan vitaha ते पिमा मेव कौंतेय यजंत्य विधि पूर्वकम सोडीपलिटाइज देवता सो मच गीता से वर्शिपिंग कृष्णा दे वर्शिप यू ओनली एंड देन they send me a translation of this verse and in that translation this last line avidhi purvakam was completely missing they said those who worship the devatas other devatas they also worshiping me that's all then i asked them where do you get this from because i showed them that this is clearly that verse verse is there avidhi purvakam so they pointed me to a prominent hindu website which had that then i wrote to the editor of the hindu website i told him And this is the translation clearly. So then, then the, the translator was a, the editor was a uh, he was a reasonable person, but he said, you know, religion is very complicated. Scripture is very complicated. Different people have different translations. So he said that, you know, we look at eight most popular uh, translations of the Gita. and then we look at it, what is the translations used by those eight prominent translations and based on that we decided which translation we are going to put on our website so 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 he says i know swami prabhupad has in his translation avidhi purvakam this is all the other translators they don't have that so therefore we decided not to put it this is we want to on our website teach the bhagavad present the bhagavad gita as it is understood by the majority of the hindus i said the truth or i said scripture is not a product of majority opinion <laughs> <laughs> But but the point is that many of the people who have translated the Gita, if you look at them, or whose Gita translations have become translation commentaries have become influential, many of them were they might have had some spiritual inclinations, but their often agenda or their intent agenda has a slightly negative connotation. Let's be neutral and say that their intent, their intent was not really spiritual. Their intent was often nationalistic. it's almost like in the indian independence struggle several of the independence uh, fighters they noble and respected they got independence for india that's glorious but many of them it is when they were arrested by the british government put in jail 
In jail, you are nothing to do, write a Gita commentary. <laughs> it's an over, oversimplification, but largely that's what happened. And many of them actually proudly say that we didn't read any Gita commentary, any traditional commentary on the Gita. They say that this is what the Gita means to me, this is what the Gita means to India right now as I see it. Okay, can the Gita be read like that? Fine, you read it like that if that's what you want to do. But then, is that, like Prabhupada would say, is that Bhagavad Gita as it is, is that Bhagavad Gita as you are? <laughs> so, this is unfortunate. Now, Krishna does say, take me, Mahameva County. They also come to me. It's like the prince is back in the king's, palace, king's kingdom. And that is good. But still, is that the best thing? It's not the same thing. So, many of these Gita commented their for purpose is more on unifying Hindus rather than teaching the Gita. For them, the Gita is a tool for Hindu unification. And that is one of the reasons also that Mayavad had a resurgence. Now, after all the Vaishnava commentators, starting from Ramacharya, Shankaracharya was immensely influential. But Ramacharya, Madhvacharya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all the Bhakti saints, through all of them, what happened was Actually, the influence of Advaitavad started diminishing substantially. But when India's independence struggle started coming up, at that time, those who are seeking independence, they realized that uh, religion is a very powerful galvanizing force in India. Now, if we want to use religion to unify Indians, but Indians means primarily Hindus in this case, at one level, and how do we do that? Hindus are divided into so many sects and so many kinds of worship and so many objects of worship. So they decided from a perspective of political expediency, expediency is convenience, a perspective of political convenience that if that one Brahman is the ultimate reality and all the devatas are subordinate to that, then the Brahman can be unifying. If you worship the various devatas, that can be divisive. So, if you consider any particular devata to be the supreme, that will divide India. Now, will it? I, we don't know, but the point is, this is not based on the spiritual teaching of the tradition. This is based on political convenience. That's how Mayavad or impersonalism, which it may be may or not Mayavad, it can be Brahmavad also, Brahmavad also, that received a Philip, that received a big boost at the time of independence. And even now, that is a prominent strand of thought, which is there in India. So now, with, this, with, with respect to these two emphasis, let's try to understand from my examples perspective. So what should be emphasized? That they too come to me or they, what they are doing is avidhi purva. So let's consider both of these have their utility. Here this is, is it 923 or 24? 23. Mm -hmm. Say a parent, a father has two children. In the past, I used to use a father has two sons. But in America, we say, why father? Why sons? So, <laughs> why so much? <laughs> why so male centered? <laughs> so, <laughs> say a parent has two children. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, say, one of them is very good at studies and gets 90% marks. I say that is the highest marks you can get is that, or that subject. And the other person just scrapes through and gets 40% marks. And now, both of them have come to, uh, come to the parent. And, no, no. So, both of them have got 65% marks. And they come to the parent. When they come to the parent, the parent will say to this person, Shabash, well done. And this person will say, Badmash, what have you done? <laughs> now, is 65% a good thing or a bad thing? It depends. it depends on where you are coming from. Isn't it? So, for those who are coming from 40%, 65% is a good thing. 
But for somebody who can't be at 90%, 65% is a bad thing. So similarly, if somebody is coming from materialism, Bhautikvad, to Devata worship, that is a good thing. But somebody is coming from Bhakti, Krishna Bhakti, to Devata worship, that is a bad thing. So, if this is the emphasis, then we can say, Tepi Mameva Konteya. That they are also worshipping me. Tepi Mameva Konteya. But for somebody who can worship Krishna, Yajantya Avidhi Purvakam. So, is it uh, Krishna is saying they are worshipping me only, but in an improper way? So what is to be emphasized depends on where we are coming from. If somebody can worship Krishna, then there is no need for them to worship Devutas. But if somebody might become a materialist or is a materialist and they start getting worshipping the Devutas, if they can come to Krishna worship, that is the greatest. But if they can't, then they are worshipping Devutas is better than their being <coughs> just materialistic. So this is, we can be inclusive. That's why I re remember I said that the Gita is inclusive. But just because inclusive, that does not mean it is not inconclusive. Hmm? It is inclusive that Devta worship is also included within the broad teachings of the Gita. And it's also, it's not exactly totally content. Krishna says, I have set up the system. I give the faith to the worshippers of the Devta so that they can grow. So it's inclusive. But does that mean that worship of Krishna and worship of Devta is the same thing? No, it does not. It is not inconclusive. There is a conclusion. And Krishna is differentiating <coughs> my worship and Anya Devata. And previously, in the seventh chapter, Krishna says, Kamai Staistai Ratagyana Prapadyanti Anya Devata. That those whose desires are, whose, whose intelligence, jnana, is stolen by Kama, they will worship the Devatas. Just like the prince, why did the prince have to go to anyone other than the father? It's because the prince has something wrong. There's something wrong with the relation. That's why the prince is going there. It's better that the prince worships the prince comes back to the father only. Like that. It's be much better if somebody worships Krishna. But if somebody is not, then we should not go to war with those people. See, our difference between the worship of Devuta and the worship of Krishna, it is not at all like the Abrahamic difference between the worship of the one true God and the worship of the false gods. The devtas do not have to be demonized so that for Krishna to be glorified. Not we say that actually speaking, if we we should also respect the devtas. Now there is over respecting which is to be avoided, which is true. But there should not also be under respecting. We have to be careful about it. Mm. So Personally, I prefer the word Devata to Demigod because many people in the West, see what happens is in the Western world, the word Demigod does not mean the same thing which we think it means. See, Prabhupada used the word Demigod in the sense that there is God, there are humans and there is someone in between. Hmm? That is a Demigod. Hmm? But in the Western tradition, the Demigod is used to refer to somebody who is born half from a human being and half from a god. So technically the Pandavas would be demigods because the Pandavas had an earthly mother and a celestial father. So that is the meaning and somehow many Hindus they associate the word demigod with a negative connotation and it's almost like demigod and demon. It's like they consider that word to be very problematic. So we can use that word, Prabhupada used it, certainly we use it, but it ha it triggers certain connotations. And Devata is a clear traditional word, it's a respectful word from our tradition, so I prefer that word. But whatever word we use, the important thing is the concept we understand. And we see how we can best elevate others. So if in our family, if say Devata worship is going on, that is a part of our tradition. Now we don't have to be disruptive about it. Now, we may not want to worship the Devata, that's okay. We want to worship Krishna. But if, say, our whole family is going to a Devata temple or there's a Devata puja happening in our home, you know, we don't have to minimize it. We don't have to trivialize it. We don't, certainly don't have to demonize it. 
that would be a terrible thing to do. Hmm. Uh, now, are those who are worshipping Devata less intelligent? Yes, less intelligent is still intelligent. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, worshipping Devatas is still much better than materialism in many ways. Now, of course, I don't want to give only one side of the story. Sometimes people can get stuck in the worship of Devatas and they never rise to anything higher. That also happens. But still, that piety is not a problem. For most, see, most people who worship a devta, they are very rarely exclusive devta worshippers. That means they will worship that particular devta, but they will also be ready to worship Krishna. It's like uh, no no Hindu will say Krishna is not God. They all accept Krishna is God. Their problem is they say only Krishna is God. That is where their problem comes. From. Now, do we need do we need to teach that? Yes, that is the teaching of the Gita. But how do we teach that? Do we teach that in a way that educates and elevates or do we do that in a way that agitates and alienates? That is something which is our expertise. Say for example now, in India, especially I am Maharashtra, in Maharashtra there is this worship of Ganesh. It is spreading all over India also now. It is a big worship and in Ganesh, worship, what is the standard prasad that they give? Sorry? Modak. Yes, it is on Ganesh Puja day. Say, if there is Ganesh Puja at our home, at our relatives' home, and they make Modak, I say, we don't take Devutas Prasad. <laughs> okay, throughout 365 days, if we are taking Krishna Prasad, on one day, if we take one handful, it's not that the sky is going to fall on our head and Krishna is going to kick us to hell. No, it is, it is okay. So just, Krishna, I am doing this as a service to you. I don't want to create a disruption in society. We say, remember what Krishna says? Don't agitate the minds of others. A devotee is one who is not agitated by others, but who does not agitate others. There can be a time when we talk about the worship of the devatas and their philosophical place. But at that particular time, when the whole mood is centered on worship of the devatas, that is not the time for us to criticize the devatas in any way. So just take that prasad if it's required and just move on with life. It's one morsel of food. There's one devotee, sometimes you know devotees have this uh, pure devotee syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> we call it PDS. So what happened was this devotee, he went home and he was given the prasad, he took it and he put it in his mouth. And then he went out and from the window he spit it out. And one of his relatives saw it. And it was like, suddenly the Ganesh Puja venue became Kurukshetra. <laughs> <laughs> How can you spit out Prasad? Uh, it is very, he, he tried, the more he tried to explain, the more they became angry. And then they said, just stop going to his con and, and, this, and it just became unnecessarily complicated. And normally spitting out any food is not good. You know, Anna is ultimately a blessing coming from Krishna. But spitting out something that is you know, sanctified and offered. Now, that devotee is not a bad devotee. But it's just like misdirected devotion. So, so what happens is that sometimes uh, fanaticism that comes, it is not because of too much faith. It is because of too little intelligence. <laughs> faith is a good thing but faith has to be intelligently applied okay my expression of faith what is it going to do right now is it going to elevate people is it going to elevate me now because of that one incident one action what happened was his whole family became anti score and his own Krishna consciousness like so many obstacles came in that so what is the big deal? So we can avoid being fanatical. We want to avoid being divisive. So fanaticism, it is not because, oh, my faith is so strong, I will never compromise. Well, there is compromise which is bad, but there is common sense. <laughs> that is good, isn't it? So the two are not the same thing. Too much faith is because of too little intelligence. 
Somebody say, I will no compromise. Yeah, don't compromise. That means we don't have to say that Krishna, that the Devutas are supreme. Okay, some mantras, we can chant those mantras, but after that we can chant some Brahma Samhita mantras about that particular Devata or whatever. That we can do in our mind. Hmm? Doesn't matter. But it is too little, little, little no common sense. And Prabhupada said many times, Krishna consciousness is common sense. According to time, place, circumstance, what to speak where? See, when Prabhupada was studying in Scottish Church College, at that time, his professor was a Christian professor. And he said this Hindu theory of karma, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Why? <coughs> because somebody has done something wrong, who is the witness to watch that wrong? Who is the witness to give evidence? And without a witness, how can somebody be punished? Now Prabhupada knew the answer, that was, it is a Paramatma in the heart. But Prabhupada felt that it is the Scottish Church College, he says, that is their college, it is, I am a student there, I cannot disrupt over there. Now Prabhupada, he, did he give the truth? Yes, at the right place, he did give the truth. And he enlightened so many people with the truth. But a strategic silence is not compromise. So common sense means sometimes just have a strategic silence. So, one last point I'll make now. In the ninth chapter, basically the last part of it, I said I started by, by Krishna is speaking all this to glorify the path of bhakti, to qualify, establish how by practicing bhakti one can get whatever we get by other paths, but we can get that and all and more. But before he can do that, what he's establishing is that actually every that if what happens in the world, everything is not necessarily his will. Because if we have that notion that even bad things are done to me by God, then it's very difficult to devote ourselves to that God. To think of that God as a God of love, where that God can arbitrarily do anything to anyone. Or that can God, God can let people do anything. And the God doesn't intervene. So Krishna is clarifying that. Broadly speaking, that different people have different orientations. So, in that sense, if we consider this upside down bowl and say Krishna is up here, it's an interesting shape. I don't want to intervene, okay. So, this is Krishna. So, so this is Krishna above this. Krishna, we are not here in Krishna right now. But, you know, in this upside down bowl, we could be as close to Krishna as possible, we could be as far as away as possible. So, this is 9.13.14. Krishna talks about the Mahatmas. They are so close to Krishna that they are almost as if with Krishna. Then the offenders, the demoniac, they are here. And then in between are all other Devta worshippers, Devta Upasak and the Brahmavadi is those who seek oneness and the Vishwarup Pasaks, Vishwarup worshippers. So they are all in between. And of course, we can say the spectrum of humanity goes down further. Among the demonic, that can be atheistic, various kinds of things. But this is a spectrum of humanity. And different people are situated in different places. But now Krishna will say that the path of bhakti can elevate everyone from everywhere. This is the glory of Bhakti. So he is talking about his position and the relationship of everyone with this, in the, with him in this world so that this last conclusive teaching can come. And here Krishna talks about four glories of Bhakti which can be conveyed using an acronym EASE. Ease is what? It is, first of all, easy. Easy is, where Krishna says, Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Prayachati. Then, it is, it is all embracing. All embracing means, 
Krishna says that anybody can practice it. That even those who are low born, they can also practice it. This is 932-33. Then he says it is safe. Safe means even if like if some medicine is safe, that means even there are some side effects, they are very marginal. So safe is Krishna talks about apichet sudurachara. That even those who do something wrong, they don't fall away. They are still within my purview. And the results are everlasting. That is 9.22. So in this way, Krishna is telling that the glory of bhakti is that it includes and elevates everyone. So it's easy. So you don't need elaborate paraphernalia. So this is in this section, Krishna is substantiating the point that he made. Whatever fruits you can get from Yadya Dhanatapa, you can get it all and you can get more by the practice of bhakti. So how does that happen? That's what he is describing over here. But it's easy. You don't need elaborate paraphernalia to do yajna. It's all embracing. You know, many of these actors like yajna, especially only those who are uh, those who are at a particular level of ritual purity, they can do it. Not everyone can do it. And in some parts, one mistake and you are destroyed. Like Pritrasur, what happened was that one mantra chanted little intonation wrong. An opposite result. So it's safe and somebody can get elevated to heavens, stay in the heavens for a long time, but after that, te punye, te, te shine, te shine they come back. Shine detam paktva, sargalokam vishalam, shine punye, martilokam vishanti, they come back again. So in this way, bhakti is is so potent, it's so glorious that Krishna will say that therefore o Arjuna anityam asukam lokam that you are born in this world just to practice bhakti. This world is a place of distress, it's a temporary world. The same thing which Krishna has said earlier in 815 to Kalam he says yes this world is a terrible place but bhakti is the cure, just practice bhakti. And Krishna concluded, Man Mana Bhav Mad Bhakto, that famous verse where he says that you just practice bhakti and you can come to me. So that Man Mana Bhav verse, we will talk about it when we take the 18th chapter and contrast 934 with 1865. But I'll summarize now. Some points on this acronym is, I'll try to talk about, especially the safe part, I'll talk about it when we get time on that Aham Tvam Sarva Pavi Bhyo. What does that actually mean? We will discuss it that time, Krishna willing. So let's look at what we discussed in chapter 9 today. We started by talking about how speech and the idea of train of thought. So it can be linear, it can be multi perspective coming to the same point. It can be anal. It is, and it is thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. It can basically be mostly at the level of principles, and then some at the level of specifics, or it can be mostly at the level of specifics, and some at the level of principles. <coughs> but whatever it is, the key point is that in any speech, when there's a train of thought each link there, is, there has to be credibility established if the credibility is not there then people stay stuck at that particular thought so what we, we said what is required is that thoughts should stay in people's minds but people's minds should not stay in the thoughts then it becomes a problem so that was the context for discussing how will so krishna is going to elaborate on the last 828 elaboration is basically chapter 9. In that case, we discussed about how there are many things which are opposite of love. Love's opposite could be hate, love's opposite could be apathy or ignoring someone, love's opposite could be lust. And here we discussed about 
those three things or four things that that are actually the whenever there is sex there is pleasure but there is procreation there is pair bonding and then there is purification to the service of raising child raising a child so if all these come together that is the best but if only the first comes then that is not so these are basically <coughs> sex its purposes and then the last difference we discussed it love will be envy so the idea is that if we this is especially in terms of when we hear the glories do we feel delighted or do we feel distressed do we feel angered agitated so so when we talk about envy of god that is more in not in terms of he is out of our league so we won't have envy that's not the point over here yes he is out of the league at two that's true but what is the effect of hearing his glories do we when we want to challenge or counter his glories then what happens is krishna himself will not speak his glories just like say if we have a insecure sibling at home then we won't speak about our achievements because that will only increase that sibling's insecurity so krishna speaks so krishna speaks to the to non envious because they are not insecure they are not agitated they will be delighted and then i discussed about this so the elaborate time that everything <coughs> that happens that are the put this put three points we discussed in that that god is the god as controller is the supreme controller but not necessarily the soul controller he is the cause of all causes not the cause of all effects i discussed about how the exist difference was the shasan's power came from krishna but the specific use of that power say disrobing the dropadi that didn't come from krishna so god's role in our actions it can range from he, we are doing what he wants us to do or that's his uh, our his intention or it is his concession his permission we want to do and he allows us to do it so the metaphor was of of a sky being like the up sky is god's will range of god's will. so nothing happens without god's will but that doesn't mean that whatever hap- is happening is god's will so this within that is our will where we go and what we do the wind and its movement so everything that happens what was what, is it is it good yeah everything that happens to say is good is not good <laughs> so it is for good or more specifically it can be for good so it depends on how we respond i discussed the example of vidura's reaction here then we discussed about the range of people from we discussed the difference between that there are the pure devotees we didn't discuss so much devotees <coughs> demoniac and then in between so that with respect to the ammonia could discuss the difference between brahmavadis they are not offensive to krishna versus they are not the same as mayavadis because mayavadis they want to say krishna's form is maya the krishna's form is not my preference that's the difference and then we talked about how the devata worshipers we can see them positively that they are better than materialists and their arrangement of worship is done by krishna negative vision would be that they are not worshiping not krishna devotees so depending on what is the context we have to decide which is to focus on like the child who gets 65% where is the child coming from so definitely the devatas are not the same as the false gods in the abrahamic religions and then lastly we discuss the glory of bhakti in terms of 
the EASE acronym. <coughs> how it is easy, it is all embracing, it is safe and its results are eternal or everlasting. Once we go to Krishna, we don't come back to this world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are there any quick questions? Okay, where is the mic? That mic can go there. Yeah. You were explaining this Vidura section, ki how uh, Vidura, Vidura's attitude was correct and by that you saw Vidura's action as Krishna's intention. I didn't say it was Krishna's intention. It's Krishna's arrangement. It was Duryodhana's only intention. He, he saw some arrangement of Krishna in that. It is that there is an opportunity to serve Krishna here. It is not that Duryodhana's words were spoken because Duryodhana wanted to serve Krishna. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So it's when bad people do bad things, it is not Krishna making them do bad things, they are doing the bad thing. But even within their bad actions, there is some arrangement of Krishna. So rather than saying this is Krishna's arrangement, you can say there is some arrangement of Krishna in this. So I have to find out what that arrangement is and respond appropriately. So when Prabhupada's outreach in India was not successful, Prabhupada could say this is Krishna's arrangement, Krishna doesn't want me to do any outreach, let me just chant Hare Krishna and be happy in Vrindavan. Prabhupada said, there is some arrangement of Krishna in this. What is the arrangement? Actually, Indians are not receptive because they are infatuated by the West. And the first instruction that my Guru had given me was speak in English. Speak to, speak in, he had given me the instruction, speak the Western world. You know, you should travel across the world and share Krishna message. That is what I am going to do. Thank you. Does the concept of Maya Vadi was present before the Adi Sankracharya or it came after him? <coughs> the concept of Mayavad present before Shankaracharya, well, it's a little difficult to say. <coughs> Gaudapad was his was one of his predecessor teachers. And he has also written some teachings which seem to be like Mayavadi. But uh, see, what essentially happened, Shankaracharya also had a benevolent intention, whatever be the subsequent result of that. From the 5th century BC to 5th century AD, Hindu, uh, Hinduism had a serious decline in India. Buddhism and Jainism spread big time. In fact, the that is considered the classical period. So, the maximum books on maximum books propagating atheism in that period were written in Sanskrit. Buddhists and Jains. Now, we normally think of the pious people. Actually, they're atheists in the sense that they don't accept the idea of a personal god. Although eventually, they incorporated the idea of uh, the iconography of the devtas into their particular tradition and then after that they said okay you worship all these other ultimately you go into the shunya or you attain the moksha whatever there is understand moksha is. but anyway the point is that it was hugely influential and that had to be countered so Shankaracharya at that time uh, took from the Vedantic teachings uh, teachings which seemed similar so, in one sense, if you look at Shankara's, Shankaracharya's teaching of Brahma, it is actually an intellectual clone of the Buddhist teaching of Shunya. Hmm? Intellectual clone means it's exactly very similar, but it's drawing from a Vedic nomenclature and it is bringing spiritual reality into the conception of the of liberation. Spiritual reality in the sense of that spiritually I talked in the Vedas. So his purpose was also benevolent to get people who have gone out of the Vedic fold to come back to the Vedic fold. But then things went on thereafter. So what did he do from, in, for his for that case? From the broad body of Vedic literature, 
he took those teachings which focused on the Brahman as the ultimate reality. And there was a Buddhist teacher in the 4th or 5th century, so I forget his name now, quite a famous Buddhist teacher. Because Buddhism had this problem that where did, where is the, if there is no self, where does our self, sense of self would come from? So they propagate that there are two levels of reality. There is, there is, uh, there is our daily reality, which they say is ultimately false, and there is actual reality. So that was the idea, that was the way of interpreting that Adi Shankaracharya took. And what he did was, there is Vyavaharik. Now these terms are perfectly fine. And then there is Paramarthik. Hmm? Now that means there is our operational reality and there is ultimate reality, which is fair enough. But then what he did was, he divided scripture. He said, he took a certain number of small texts of scriptures and he said, these are the Mahavakya. These give us the ultimate reality. And everything else in scripture is Laguvakya. Now, now, now I am very, uh, I am giving a very bare bones analysis of what has happened because it's, the history is complex, the analysis is, has many layers to it, but this is what essentially he did. So now what happened was, the Ramanacharya later asked this question, the basis of dividing scripture into Mahavakya and Laguvakya, this is not given in scripture. Hmm? And it is he who decided these are the Mahavakya, like Aham Brahma, Asmi, Tattva, Masi, and all these are Mahavakya. Now, do they contain wisdom? Of course they contain wisdom. But can we say that this is the wisdom that overrides everything else in scripture? Okay, on what basis? If you were to say that, on what basis? Now, these are actually 0.1% of scripture. More than 99% of scripture is means what he does, all the Mahavakya, he says they are about non-dual reality. That means all our perception of you are here and I am here, God is up there and I am here. Most of scripture is like that. People are worshipping the Devatas, people are worshipping the Supreme Lord. So he, so if we say that all those statements are false and only these are true. It's like say, if I give a two hour class and if after the class you say, this one statement that he made in the class, that's true, everything else is false. <laughs> well, okay, you can say this is the most important statement. Now, that also is, a, unless I say this is the most important point, you could say, what you could say is, I found this most relevant. I consider this to be most important. That's fair enough. But to say that even this is the most important is itself, you'll have to establish that in some way, based on my statements. So this is the only true statement and others are false. That is problematic. So basically, uh, can the teachings of impersonalism be drawn from scripture? Definitely, from the Upanishads. But can the teaching that Mayavad, specifically in the sense that Brahman is the only reality and even Bhagawan is like a convenient fiction, can that be drawn from scripture? That requires a considerable twisting of scripture. Uh, now Shankaracharya, to his credit, he was a brilliant writer. You know, just the beauty of his writing. Just like in English also some people play words and it's, it's an elegance and majesty to the writing or speaking. Like Shankaracharya's writing is brilliant. His Sanskrit was magnificent. But just because the language and the style is magnificent does not necessarily mean that the message that he has given is necessarily the highest. So what happened was <coughs> that uh, or the, the, inter or the, message, the interpretation that he has given is the highest. Mm. So another point is that there are definitely places where he talks about worship of the Supreme Lord as the highest. This kind of prayers are very categorically there. Now, in fact, he is saying that you know, don't get caught in intellectual analysis. Why are you focusing so much on this? But the way some of his followers interpret it is now, these are the times when Shankaracharya went into bhakti ecstasy and he is demonstrating how bhakti ex ecstasy can make you speak a false truth. Or bhakti ecstasy can make you and condemn the truth as untruth. And therefore, when subsequent teachers go into bhakti ecstasy, 
you should not be misled by them <laughs> so essentially what happened what what shankaracharya did with the vedic scriptures his followers did with his words <laughs> Okay, this is not to criticize the Shankaracharya's followers. They are all brilliant people in their own way, and their, their level of study of scripture is deep. But unfortunately, the interpretation that they came out, whether it's real, whether it can actually be okay, impersonalism, the Advaita Vad, as a philosophy, even Maya Vad, as a philosophy has an elegance to it. That the idea there is oneness. And you know the world is so divided. There is a oneness in which we all exist. In. Actually, no none of us exist because you know the Brahman is the only thing that exists. Our oneness, oneness doesn't exist. There is, there is a certain intellectual elegance to the philosophy. There are holes in it, but there are holes in every philosophy. There's an elegance <coughs> to the philosophy. But the problem is that to say that this philosophy is based on the Vedas or the Vedic body of knowledge. That is very very difficult to prove unless you reject majority of the scripture. Okay. Okay. Just like in our Varanasi case, uh, Mayavadi, it is center of Mayavadi. It is said. Hmm. So they, why they worship Lord Shiva as a uh, See, over the centuries, even from Shankaracharya's time itself and his example also. While he talked of Mayavad, he, it was clear to him and it became increasingly clear to subsequent generations that this kind of Mayavadi oneness was something very difficult for most people to even conceive or to speak of, make that as the solitary meditation. So they said that Bhakti, ke, bhakti is a path for most people, but Bhakti is like a transitional path till you get to Mukti. So now, at different times, in different places, different deities and their worship has become prominent. Now, that is a whole matter of religious sociology and psychology, which if you want to take it from an empirical perspective, that why a particular uh, deity becomes more popular. Like Ganesh Puja, that was, was is Ganesha definitely a part of our Vedic tradition, but there was an um, independence leader, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, he popularized Ganesh Puja as a means of unifying Indians. So that's more from a religious historical perspective why Ganesh Puja is popular. Mm. Now another perspective you can take it is that that when certain temples become very prominent, then that particular deity becomes also very prominent. So Kashi Vishwanath has a very venerable history, and while there are Vishnu temples also in this area. But that temple has had a very extraordinary history and that temple became the object of veneration. And that's how Kashi became a place associated with Lord Shiva. Okay. Okay. Why is this Why worshipping? Why? What is worship of the Vishwarupa? Well, that's described in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that those who can't really, those who are not yet ready to worship the person, personality of Godhead, or those who are just having material conceptions very prominently while worshipping God, then for them it is recommended that they can observe the greatness of the universe and conceive and connect that greatness of the things of this world with the greatness of God. So basically, you can think of, it's, it's a conceptualization of God by connecting him with the great things in the universe. So for example, the rivers can be considered to be the water in the navel of the Lord. The mountains can be considered to be like the bones of the Lord. The trees can be considered to be like the hair on the body of the Lord. So it's a conceptualization, but by the conceptual, by the conceptual tool, one can, while looking at the world, direct one's thoughts towards God. So that is basically Vishwarupa. So, ara Aradhana. It's not so much of a puja. It's more of a contemplation. Now, of course, the idea that God has many hands and many legs, that is there in many uh, the 
that is there the purush sukta and other places so that's fair enough but the specific upasana is more of a meditation of god's greatness um, by contemplating the great things in the universe yes bro yeah guruji here is an online question uh, by manshu that how to understand our acharyas asking us to be very exclusive in our devotion to krishna example bhakti vinod tagur tells one shouldn't take prasad of devta at all i would need to see the reference for this where does he say this mm-hmm. and uh, i think you know when such statements are made we also have to look at the context and uh, my understanding at least from what i have read about bhakti vinod tagore which is quite a bit he also made statements while he was uh, responding to the worship of durga and sometimes in the worship of not not i would say not durga but durga also the goddess has many forms that this kali worship and sometimes in some forms of worship only meat is offered so that meat can't be taken and sometimes it meat and other things are cooked at the same time and it's all offered in the same plate you may say i'll take a you but still it's it's so that kind of it is offered but it is quite tamasic so my understanding would be it would be in that context but i'll have to look at the specific reference to understand this hmm? one more uh, question by girish how bhakti said in case of inserting question how bhakti safe in case of insulting vaishnava how is bhakti safe well <clears throat> even if we insult vaishnavas even we offend vaishnavas what happens by that is the taste for worshiping krishna gets covered taste in uh, chanting krishna's name just in glorifying krishna that gets covered but covered doesn't mean it is gone forever it is there but we have lost access to it so eventually we will gain access back so it's safe in the sense that what we have achieved it is not taken away from us forever by wrong way it is there for us but it may not be accessible for us the if we say safety means what i have done will never ever be taken away from me then that means we are letting it override the power of our free will it like if i say bhakti means if i turn toward krishna i'll never be able to turn away from krishna they are that that means you know it's basically it is a path of love which will make us like a robot that means i will never have a choice to turn away from krishna so that is not the meaning of safe safety means that even if we make mistakes we won't be forever condemned Aditesh Kumar, uh, yeah. Sometimes Vaishnav etiquettes can be very problematic to some starting bhaktas. So how to see these etiquettes in bhakti? Like many times, our focus gets shifted more towards <coughs> etiquettes and not on bhakti itself. Yeah. So we have to be careful what we prioritize. See, sometimes we become mayavadis in our practice of bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by mayavadis is. that everything is one every rule is equally important <coughs> no different rules are of different importance and we have to understand which rule is how important i was talking with a very intelligent american young man <coughs> i mean he's a he's a middle aged man now he is a he was he studied religious studies he came to hinduism and through academic studies he came came to explore krishna consciousness very thoughtful person and he became interested in krishna consciousness he came to a temple and then he came to temple and he was sitting and attending a class and he was the only american in in our temples in america mostly they are having indians now coming americans come but not so often and in this class he was the only american he was sitting on the floor which is also not very common you go to american churches churches also have pews where people sit comfortably on the uh, pews uh, on on chairs basically chair like surfaces <clears throat> and he was sitting on the floor and hearing a class and after that he asked the question is prabhu and the person next to him slapped him on his thigh says he is not a prabhu he is a maharaj you are committing offense 
this is a person who has come for the first, first time to temple and he uh, he's sitting and hearing a class and he wants to ask a question also. So what difference does he make whether he refers to Prabhu or Maharaj? So there is, uh, so it has to be very, we shouldn't be eager to correct others. <coughs> One of the characteristics of uh, divine nature, Krishna says, a paishunam. A paishunam is aversion to fault fighting. That means sometimes we have to find faults, but we should not be eager to find faults. So in the Radha Gopna temple, it happened that you know nowadays all over India in our temples, a lot of young people are coming. My boys and girls also come together at times. And even if it's boy or girl comes, many people want to take selfies with the deities. They want to take selfies in the temple wherever they can and include the deities. So now turning the back toward the deities is, is not very good. It's offensive. Specifically, turn, you know, when we're going away, we'll turn our back. But but while deliberately turning the back and taking a photo, that's so the devotee is asked, as well as Radhan Maharaj, you know, should we tell them no, don't do this? So Maharaj said, yeah, turning the back to the deities was not good. But he says, once we start, just make it a rule that they should not do it. And people start telling this. We will not be able to control who will tell this how. And many people may <coughs> tell it in a way that hurts and anger and, and alienates people. So he said, the Krishna is Bhavagrahi, that we should not enforce. And I'm not giving this as absolute principle in all temples, but I'm just giving this point that okay, the one point is don't turn your back to the deities. That's the important thing. The other point is that people who come to the temple should not go away with a bad taste. And now, what is more important when somebody is coming to the temple? Is it making sure that Krishna is not offended? Or is it that people get an uh, impression which makes them want to come again? We can say both are important. We can't say that one is less important. But relatively speaking, you know, if uh, we were to, if we are in a movement for outreach, then making sure that we don't alienate people unnecessarily is important. And, you know, this is a sad truth that enforcing rules, it becomes like a righteous excuse. Righteous means, oh, I am right. Righteous excuse for our controlling mentality. We all have Ishwar Bhav within us. We all want to control. And whenever there is a rule to be implemented, Forcing others to implement that rule, that just becomes our excuse for letting our controlling mentality. It's We may say, I am doing this out of service attitude, but the way we do it is that it's like, even with the best microscope, nobody will find the service attitude in the way we do it. <laughs> it, 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 it might be there so deep somewhere. It's not seen in our actions, it's not seen in our words, it's not seen in our tone. It is just not seen by the others. So, we have to be careful. So, in my understanding, uh, etiquettes, it shouldn't be that, especially when people are new, it shouldn't be every single devotee telling every other devotee what is the etiquette. Let the particular guide of that devotee tell that person. And if at other times some devotee is not doing something properly, there's no, no need to make it a big issue about it. So, we'll continue tomorrow. Any question? No. So, we'll continue tonight. Tonight, we'll be discussing the 10th chapter. We'll go straight forward. And then, in the last chapter, 18th will be discussed tomorrow morning. That will be our conclusion of the Gita. Thank you so much. Shrimad Bhagavad Gita ki Shri La Prabhupad ki chai Gaur Bhakt Brind ki chai Gaur Prima Manandi